getting right back into the Rite of Spring for one of my favorite passages in the entire work. I think this is one of the best orchestral climaxes of all time, so I'm so excited to just rip it apart and figure out exactly how Stravinsky pulls it off. Here we go. All right, so picking up from where we left off last time, we had just talked about this big uh, wind flourish with string flourish where the winds are moving chromatically and the strings are moving diatonically. Then there's this giant trill with all the winds trilling, everyone else doing this semitone motion. And then everyone is just united together here on this upper gesture, which is the main melody that we've been hearing up to this point over and over and over and over again in this section. We have everyone doing that and then some accompanimental stuff in the background. Everyone lands on a big shot chord. Uh, the orchestration for that chord, if we zoom in just a little bit, is upper winds on A, all the flutes are on A, oboes, ev oboes form an F major chord, and then clarinets are also on the F major chord. So it's basically like bassoons are down here, clarinets are here, and then flutes are all up at the top. Uh, oboes and sorry, oboes and clarinets are uh, in the same octave. And then for the brass, we have horns that are up really high in their register playing this F chord, trumpets that are an octave above that, and trombones an octave below that, strings doubling this entire chord, blending everything together. This seems to be the typical orchestration for large orchestra chords. We're going to have flutes up top playing octaves or something like that. And then we've got the oboes and clarinets doing harmonic material in a more middle register or middle high register. Then the brass kind of sits just slightly below that, maybe the trumpets doubling whatever the lowest winds were playing. And then underneath that, you have your accompanimental instruments doing something else. Strings blending everything throughout the spectrum to make sure that everything is mixed together. You can apply that to most chords. So if you just want to write a excuse me, you want to write a well-orchestrated chord, just go through, put it together like that. That makes the most sense. Uh, and then this kind of doubling actually continues for these melodic lines because all those instruments are quite strong in those registers. So that's why it makes sense to move them around like that. Everyone projects and you get that large, really big, full orchestral sound. If everyone was in bad registers, like low flute, low trumpet, high oboe, uh, maybe violin harmonics really high, something like that, they're all playing weak material, weak uh, in, and they're in their weak registers. And if everyone's playing in weak ed registers, clarinet kind of around the break, then the orchestral sound is gonna sound kind of pathetic or small. So you don't wanna have that be the case. So if you can just get everyone playing in ideal registers all the time, you're gonna pull off good orchestration. Then we reduce down to just the clarinets playing the primary melodic material and playing it in thirds. Uh, in this case, they're playing it with the addition of the strings and underneath that, we have this like super unsettling uh, tuba stuff, which is like secondary material. So this is like a dissonant counterpoint to the melody. Uh, I analyzed it briefly last time. The melody is a, is a, oh, it's a G natural. And then the tuba is playing a G sharp. So we get this kind of very dissonant sound between those two intervals. And because we have that dissonant sound, it feels very unsettling at this point. And that allows Stravinsky to create a lot of the tension moving towards this climax. This is the climax of the whole first section. So he needs to create a lot of tension. So is this big orchestral tutti then reduces down. But in, in this case, the orchestral tutti did not have a particular uh, amount of, um, it doesn't have a lot of like harmonic tension. So then when he reduces it down, he adds in tension with the, uh, with the counterpoint between these two parts. Oh, interesting, that only, that only happens for three bars. Stops here, oops. So that material stops here and then adds in clarinet piccolo with that as well as oboes get added in and flutes. So most people, everyone is kind of slowly joining this texture. They, do, they aren't all jumping in all at once into the texture and just going like, yeah, let's do this. Uh, so let's listen to that section. We're gonna listen to how it connects. So first of all, big tutti te texture after um, the, uh, the run up to the, to the arrival note. So here we go on that. Control. 
That texture I could hear in a movie. So they be like the elephant sounds, the trills in the horns, they're kind of wild. I really like that effect. Uh, also the, the trumpet's doing a trill the second time, whereas it doesn't the first time. That adds a little bit more insanity to the to the gesture. Oh, it's, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Trumpets are doing the trills. I, I knew I had it, right? Okay, so then the next section coming after this, listen to this dissonant counterpoint that creates a ton of tension. Key to note in here, actually, which I missed, but I think it has a ton of power. I'm actually gonna give it another element, is this, the bass drum. The bass drum is hitting every three beats. So the bass drum is actually creating a, oh, yeah, three every three beats. The bass drum, because it's hitting every three beats, is actually creating a polyrhythm with everything else because we have this well-established melody on top of it. Da, 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 that thing. And then underneath that, the bass drum, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. That kind of emphasis really creates a lot of rhythmic tension. So he introduces first contrapuntal tension through the dissonant interval between the, the two uh, main materials. Then he introduces uh, rhythmic tension through the use of uh, polyrhythm or a polymeter. We are almost hearing it like one part is in three, four and the other part is in four, four. He's gonna amp this up so like this is, he's laying the seeds that he's gonna then develop into this giant climax. He's also then adding in more and more people. The best way to make an orchestra sound like it's growing and getting larger is not writing crescendo marks in the instruments you already have. It's adding more people in. So you can see here that he adds these gestures in, which build a lot of, uh, a lot of power, these trills. Um, the melody is pretty much doubled in thirds and sixths. It's pretty simple. The only weird thing is the counterpoint between them. Bottom part is in kind of a different key and the upper part is in, a, is in the, the main key that it was in before. This is gonna lead us to this giant rhythmic build. So we actually, there, there's a really interesting idea here on this page, which is these kind of chattering winds that like the, it's almost like the melody just falls apart. Yeah, it's like the melody just like kind of like becomes unhinged and just goes like, Whoa, it just falls apart after everyone joins in. Let's listen to that. So there, the melody just falls apart. He introduces this really loud trumpet gesture to kind of distract you from the fact that the melody has been going on and then has this huge brass just ba 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 and that just totally obliterates everything. So we really hear this stuff as primary material. Trumpets come in, they're very loud. They like take the spotlight kind of away from this other material. I'll just scratch it. It's like kind of, they push it back into secondary status for this moment because the trumpets come in and they're so loud. And then at that point it allows him the freedom to just like expunge that from the texture entirely. And everyone kind of does that in their own unique way. Oboes, clarinet, piccolo, they're all, they have these wind flourishes a little bit as all that material discontinues. I'm just gonna quickly look at how he specifically orchestrated this giant brass kind of explosion underneath everything. So it starts, um, the tubas are playing this bass line and they're gonna be just continuous throughout this section. The pitch material for the tuba Basically F sharp major, there is a G natural at one moment right here, but basically F sharp major. So not super complicated. I also forgot that the tenor tube I believe transposes. So it's probably playing octaves or something. Uh, then it starts in trombones, then the trumpets play some notes and then the trumpet piccolo comes in. So this is this idea of sort of dovetailing and adding up. Instead of one instrument just taking the top line and playing everything, it's like you have this guy play and then this guy and then a new person comes in and that person sustains into just a chord at the same pitch level. And then you build out this kind of wedge gesture 
That's a really great orchestration from Stravinsky. It's also in uh, F sharp. So that texture is kind of taken over. In this case, F sharp major, trumpets are playing in A natural. So there we have our split chord tone between uh, A sharp and A natural, which is the chord that Stravinsky likes. I think I've talked about this before in a couple of the, my other analyses, but those chords with split chord tones, say I want to write an A major chord with a split chord tone, that sounds much more successful than this. And the reason is, is that if you have the minor third above the major third, it creates a major seventh. Whereas if you have the, mi the major third above the minor seventh, it creates, it creates a, a minor ninth, which is much more dissonant for our ear to hear. This is calmer and more sustained. This just sticks out like crazy. So that's the voicing that Stravinsky tends to go for in all of these chords. I haven't seen yet a major third above a minor third in a voicing. Okay, he then establishes this texture. So we have the tuba moving along at its own pace and in four, very clearly in four. And then we have the bass drum that is continuing underneath this in three. Bass drum in three, tuba in four. So we have four against three as a polymeter. And then we establish this bassoon gesture F-sharp, G-sharp, F-sharp, G-sharp, with a D underneath it. Oh, that's wild. So yeah, we're, we're uh, this is like an augmented chord. It's uh, with an A on top, actually. So it actually makes sense because the A is contextualized with the G, the D that's in the contrabassoon. So that feels like a, a fifth. It, this is actually a neat technique uh, for orchestrating chords. I found this recently in a piece by Vincent Ho, as well as a piece um, that I was just looking at. Those piece uh, by uh, Jacques Hetou. And these pieces, they contextualize chord tones that sometimes don't feel like they belong in the chord by placing actually consonant tones on the outside. So if you have tones that make a lot of sense on the outside, the extremities of the chord, and then within the chord, you have a lot of stuff that, for instance, doesn't make as much sense. This chord sounds a lot better because that is on the outside. So then we can make sense of the full chord. This is an augmented chord stacked on top of another augmented chord. In this case, G augmented with a G flat augmented chord stacked on top of it. Uh, in this case, it sounds kind of like a seventh chord with a split chord tone, and that's it. It's a nice sonority, actually. I actually really like it. I think it sounds quite rooted and quite good uh, without breaking any like crazy rules. It's, it's nice. Um, so that's how you can do that, though. You can do that by contextualizing with the outside tones. So here, Stravinsky is doing that. Bottom note's a D, trumpet's playing an A, so we've got that, it's kind of like rooting the sound. And then inside of here, we got the G sharp, which is the tritone, and then we have everyone, the tubas moving around in uh, F sharp. So he's gonna continue this idea. Uh, the trumpets are playing. So again, they have very simple material, and he's done this a lot in this piece. Trumpets having quite simple material. I think that it's probably the case here that it's trumpets that are the main the main gesture. So trumpets playing main main idea, and then I'm gonna assume that the tubas are the next most important thing. You don't give a part to two tubas and expect no one to hear it. Like that part should be like it should be there. I'm also gonna circle the bass drum as um, a potential candidate for actual prominent status because it's holding down this idea of this polyrhythmic texture. Everyone else is in four, bass drum is not. Uh, then we have, oh, that's horns. I'm sorry, that's horns, that's not trumpets. My bad, dislike the video now. <laughs> uh, this is all clearly accompanimental stuff. I, this oboe stuff and this horn stuff might come through as slightly important, I'm not sure, but I think it's all going to be mostly a complimental. That, that'd be my guess for this one. Let's listen to it. 
So I think that horns are going to be heard like crazy because they're in octaves and there's four of them. And then there's two tubas. You're going to hear that. Those sounds blend really well together. Everything else is double reeds um, or low horns, low, low-ish horns. I guess they're not that low, but double reeds uh, and strings, low strings. And so that stuff is going to blend less well with the brass. So you're going to have differentiation between those textures. Let's listen to it. It's going to be the end of the, that movement and then right into this one. Roll this one, why is this one? This is like movie music. There's the horns. So you hear the background texture as this like because of the snare drum. The snare drum is really driving this background texture, the rhythmic uh, emphasis to it. You also hear an accent on every two and four because of this in the horns. That sticks out as an accented two and four. Everything else just feels very background. Um, I'm hearing a lot of horn. And a lot of tuba. Okay. The coolest part is about to start. Oh, I'm so excited. Ah, this piece is great. Okay, so the neatest thing happens here. I actually occluded it by writing too much over the bass drum. The bass drum's important. But the tam-tam is also super important. Look when the tam-tam hits. Tam-tam hits on the and of one. Why is that important? Because he's gonna set up another polyrhythm. Look at this. So he sets this polyrhythm up to be also three beats long, but offset from the other one. Here, I believe it's gonna be three beats. Watch it on the next page, but it's gonna be three beats. So it hits there, then it hits there, it's three beats. So what does that create then? You have to ask yourself the question, what does that, the introduction of the tam-tam, create between then the bass drum and the tam-tam? It creates the feeling of something that's in 6-8, <laughs> which is really cool. So we have this idea that everything's in four, then the bass drum's in three. So we have four against three. Then he has the tam-tam in displaced from the bass drum, displaced from the bass drum in a way that makes it sound like the bass drum and the tam-tam together are in 6-8. So then we have like, are we now perceiving six, eight against four, four? Or are we perceiving like the original relationship with the Tam Tam just being out, out of sync? So that's the question you have to ask yourself here rhythmically with what's going on. Like, I don't know. The texture largely on this page is totally unchanged, right? And all double reeds are just going along producing background uh, material. We got horns and trombone, uh, horns and tubas producing primary material. It's almost like an ostinato now. It's not like, it doesn't feel super thematic, it's just repeating. But the super, the interesting fe feature here is the polyrhythmic effect that he's creating. Let's listen to that. Okay, this is the moment. This is the moment. As a kid, first time I heard this, I remember my teacher had been talking, like hyping this piece up, like it's revolutionary, it's amazing. I remember I listened to the first bassoon solo and I was like, whatever. Like this doesn't seem super revolutionary. It doesn't seem like something that like we need to pay that much attention to. And then I got to this moment and I was like, okay, this music is wild. This is some of the neatest stuff that I've ever uh, ever listened to. Now, when I was a kid, I borrowed my instructor's score of the Rite of Spring. I la later purchased my own. But I, I, I went through and looked at this section just to figure out how the melodic material worked. But I never really thought about how the texture worked. So I'm excited to just go through, quickly analyze this, and break down how everything fits together. Okay. So... Well, the horn is continuing to do what it, it's been doing, but I talked a little bit about how the horn sounds like it's kind of moved into the background because this doesn't sound particularly melodic. Excuse me. Things don't tend to feel melodic if they repeat. If you just have a gesture that happens and then it happens again. It's a... It's, it's, This no longer sounds like a melody if I just keep playing it. It's like, oh yeah, it's background texture. Something else is going to happen. So mel melody needs to feel like it goes somewhere. And having a melody go somewhere does not mean having the melody start on D and coming back to D. 
It's nice to have the melody actually go somewhere and end somewhere different than where it began. So choosing your end, beginning and end note at the beginning of writing a melody can be a really effective tool to get your melody to have that sense of motion, moving somewhere, going somewhere instead of just staying stagnant. Uh, so in this case, I think that the horn has moved into it like a mid-ground texture. Probably gonna hear it still a lot because it's uh, it's four horns, it's a lot of horns. The, the other horns are just punctuating things. Uh, but we're gonna have this, uh, yeah. Oh yes, the trumpet, piccolo trumpet. What's he playing? Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's in 6-4 now, he writes it in 6-4. And it's key to note how the percussion all fits into this. So the uh, timpani is now on the eighth notes. And I think that that's a snare drum. Maybe it wasn't snare drum before. It was timpani before and I just called it snare drum. What am I doing? Am I, am I sure about that? Let's just go up here. And then, oh yeah, it was timpani. So we'll just scroll back down. Uh, <laughs> oopsies. So I uh, should be fired. Um, then we got, so in terms of eighth notes, we have timpani, timpani is on eighths. Then we have um, interlocking to create this effect of, uh, it's every three quarter notes. No, every three eighth notes, we have an articulation from the tam-tam and the bass drum. So that is actually unchanged. Bass drum and tam-tam unchanged. So this continues as it did before. And then the super interesting thing here is how the snare drum comes in. Ta, 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 ta. It has four. So we now have a timpani that's doing six. Then underneath that, the tam-tam and the uh, bass drum or emphasizing that pattern of six. And then we have the four underneath all of that. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone else in the orchestra has their own kind of rhythmic gestures. So it, it appears that the strings have something that is, oh, maybe not. See, now it looks like the, this guy is doing groups of four. Because he goes down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, down, down. So every time he goes up, he starts again, he continues. So that's a four right there. I think that we're going to hear this uh, trumpet and piccolo clarinet thing as the pr principal line. Like it's so high. How are we not going to hear that? If we don't hear that, that's going to be weird. Let's listen to it and see what we hear in terms of uh, pitch pitched instruments as to what might be the most important. Oh, this section is so cool. So I actually hear da da. I don't hear that. I hear a dum bum. Mm -hmm. That's actually what I hear, which is the trumpet one line. Every recording I've listened to of this piece, I hear that trumpet one line. So I do not hear the piccolo trumpet. It's incredibly peculiar. Oh, I see how it works. Piccolo trumpet transposes up uh, a major second. So if we look at it here, the piccolo trumpet actually has the same pitch as the bottom trumpet. Do you see that? It's just an octave lower. So, ah, that's why I hear, so I don't hear, or sorry, yeah, that's what it is. I don't hear this, I hear. You hear the descending line. I feel like I hear the descending line more. It's more emphasized in some ways. The upper note almost just feels like an overtone, like a screaming overtone of that lower note. That's very, very, very interesting. Anyways, trumpet's definitely, uh, definitely providing primary material here. Now, 
I wonder if anyone else other than this clarinet is emphasizing that line to bring out that lower octave when it goes down to the D. It does not appear so. It appears. I guess the trumpets come in. There's another lower trumpet that comes in on the lower part every time there's an emphasis. Oh, no, he's just doing his own thing. Kind of. Kind of doubling someone else. These guys are coming in. Okay, everyone's landing there. But they're on different they're on different times. Dum bum dum 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 so that's every four beats. That happens every four beats. There's another thing that happens every four beats right after it. So dum bum bum ba. It's uh this this idea. So I changed it goes to the F. Or F, B. I'm gonna go back a little bit. Listen to that again. Yeah. So that's, it's like a, it's like almost like an interlocking part. You have, uh, oops. Dun, da, bom, ba, yam, ba, bom, ba, da, 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 da. So it goes back and forth like that through the brass section. Doubled in strong brasses, brass players in their in their very strong registers. So piccolo trumpet grabbing the high notes, um, regular trumpet grabbing the, the notes that are well within its register. Not trying to make them scream too much. In terms of, in terms of texture here, obviously all of this stuff is we got a bass line here, but meh. What is the bass line? Okay. This is all a compliment. Next page. Now, as Stravinsky has been doing in a lot of these sections, when the next page continues, he just very much continues the same material. He doesn't add a lot. I don't think like really anything has really been added. Like maybe he added a trumpet to support the horns on there like da 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 da. Yeah, that got added. No, it didn't, it was here from the beginning. Nothing gets added. He just keeps everything exactly the same from an instrumentation perspective. So he's not radically changing much to enhance this texture in any way. He's just like, all right, I've set up something really cool and I'm gonna let you listen to it for like five or six seconds. How, how long does this go on? It's a while. Nice. And then we're gonna have this giant pause. Total contrast. Goes somewhere totally different after that. Um, I think this is one of the best climaxes of all time. Uh, the rhythmic drive behind everything is just incredible. The insistence of these brass instruments, so interesting. The orchestration of the passage, masterful. He keeps all of his strings quite low, so they're not intruding on the texture in any way. They're just creating a bunch of sound really brings the brass to the forefront and lets everyone else support. It's a kind of texture where when you hear it, it sounds like brass and percussion. But because we're an orchestra, just brass and just percussion does not have that full orchestral sound. You really miss out on that if you only have those two choirs. So instead of missing out on that, Stravinsky just decides, we're gonna put everyone in, have everyone play. Everyone is just supporting. You can actually see that from his orchestration. Oh, in the end, actually, he moves some of the flutes up. He moves flute up to support the top, the top line. Oh, piccolo, just piccolo up to support the top line at the very end. So we can so we can circle that here. Triple forte. So go for it. I want to look quickly at the chords in this section because I want to make sure that I understand what he's doing. So. 
Here we have the same idea, which is this tritone gesture. So this is behind all of that. Then in your uh, B flat clarinets, same tritone. And down below that, looks like that's what they're playing. Yeah, thanks Stravinsky. So that's like a diminished seventh chord. Okay, so the harmony is Looks, appears to be diminished seventh chord. Hey, the melody, I just realized this, I'm silly. The melody is the same notes that the accompaniment has. The accompaniment just has. So they've unified. I think it's, I think he's mostly going for that chord so that that note is, sticks out actually. Let's see what everyone else is doing. What are strings doing? Strings are always really interesting to look at. They tend to have summation material, most of the harmonic content all in the strings or just octaves. Um, something that like shows kind of like the fundamental bones of what's going on a lot of the time. Uh, so strings are, usually I start my analysis at strings. Uh, if I'm trying to break apart a chord, something like that, should have done that this time, what am I doing? Um, we have this. Oh gosh, this is hard to figure out. Uh, it's like a... This could be a, it's like almost octatonic, but not really. It's a B natural and then a C flat. If you're studying with me, Stravinsky, F. So a lot of thirds. A lot of thirds and some stepwise motion in minor in minor seconds. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's look at the bass line. The bass line will help us. I think the bass line has solved it. A flat, C, E, A flat and then D. What? Oh. So augmented triads. So we got an augmented triad right here. Oh, we got another augmented triad here. We got some like chromatic motion that kind of fills it in. And above the augmented triad, of course we have a split chord tone. So the minor, the minor, um, a minor chord tone above that. Yeah. There's other stuff going on. He's got a lot going on in this section. I, I don't know if he's... Okay. Okay, I tried the linear analysis. Now try the vertical analysis. So if you want to figure out what's going on in a line, see, okay, does it make sense? Are, is this instrument playing anything linear, like in a linear pattern? Well, yeah, they're, every four beats, they're playing something that repeats generally. Like in this case, augmented triad, stepwise motion in the bass, then augmented triad. The upper voices also follow this pattern pretty well. Then we want to say, okay, can we make like some vertical structures out of this that make sense? Maybe he's like going like parallel chords like this, or it's a certain type of chord that's inverting every time it changes or it's three different types of chords that just go back and forth between each other, that kind of thing. So the first chord we have here is D, F, B. See, that's almost a diminished seventh chord with an A flat, which is the note that's in the bass. Right? 
this starts to fit with the analysis that I had before, which was this chord is all over the place, this diminished chord. So now I'll look at the next chord and see if that also fits. So now I notice that the upper, the voices of the strings here actually just shuffled. So it's the same diminished seventh chord. They just shuffled, the voices all moved around. Now I know in the next chord, because I have an E flat, that this, this analysis cannot continue. So now I have E flat and an A, which is another diminished seventh chord. And then I, I'll go to the next one and then I'll decide that that's enough. Oh, you broke me, Stravinsky. In this case we have, oh wait, wait, wait. We have G flat, A and C. Yep, that's another diminished seventh chord. So underneath all of this in the strings, he's got all these parallel diminished seventh chords, which are the, the voices are interacting in interesting ways and he's creating diminished seventh chords. Awesome, great. He probably just planned out, I got these diminished seventh chords, I need to get through them all in an interesting way. The, you're not gonna hear the strings very much at all because you're gonna hear mostly the, the trumpets and the, the trombones. So in this case, he probably was just like, ah, well, I'll find a cool contour for them to do. They have something interesting to play, and then it creates motion in the background. They're out of the way, they're in the lower register, the trombones and the trumpets are above this, so we're gonna hear them no matter what. Then he has the violins on these trills. So the first one is a sharp trill. So, like, or I guess, no, is it a whole tone? I don't know if it's a whole tone. I don't know if it's a whole tone. Sharp, that should mean F sharp, right? But if you're trilling from E to F, that's the same note. So if there's a sharp sign, does it mean to F to G double sharp? It's not on the key signature. Oh gosh. <laughs> then the next one is definitely a trill between D sharp and E sharp. And then I, I think it's a trill to G. I think it's a whole tone scale. Um, I'm gonna assume that it's a whole tone scale because trilling from F to G makes a lot of sense if we have a B diminished seventh chord. That fits. This fits much less, but maybe that's what he wants because that's also the melody note. <laughs> Hard to know. Hard to know. So these guys have whole tone scale material. Whole tone scale. These guys are diminished sevenths. Yep. Ah, I feel vindicated. Flute has F. Ah. Oh. F and G flat. No, it's G flat. So he wants G flat. Not vindicated, not whole tones. Go ahead, take it out. It's not whole tones. He wants it to be the melody note. So the top note of the trill is the melody note. And uh, what, are these, what are these oboes playing? Ah, diminished seventh chords. They're playing. They're just playing a bunch of basically diminished fifths. If you, it's like, if you ever write a tritone, you just should write a diminished seventh chord <laughs> or play an octatonic scale. They just fit really well together. When you use those materials together, everything just works. Uh, so yeah, Stravinsky's doing that here. And then it continues for three pages. And he makes an awesome climax and then just has a giant grand pause. How do you end a climax like this? Just stop. <laughs> Not particularly artful, but awesome. Uh, and the impression of this is actually quite stunning when then he starts the next movement and the next movement is completely different. It's so soft, so quiet, and there's like nothing happening. And that only happens for like three bars. So we have, this is the kiss of the earth which I guess is four bars long. And then you have the dancing out of the earth. This is the last section, I believe, before the next part starts. So we got 20 minutes, maybe we'll get to the next part today. That's what I was hoping for actually. Uh, we'll just quickly listen to this section here. It's got some, it's got timpani and bassoon that are doubling on a high-ish high note. And then you have a, a bassoon solo. Bassoon, so oh, it's not much of a solo, but have a super cool chord underneath that, or actually in the same register. That's a contrabassoon solo. So 
Oh, that's neat. So this is like a B flat, B flat sharp 11 almost. Kind of. Because there's no notes filling it in. And then this would be the minor third. And that's the major third. And then back to the minor third. Cool sound. I'll write that down. Um, B flat sharp 11. These chord symbols are not always the best. Uh, they're good for some purposes, but they're also not good for other purposes. So it's better for you to just use your own uh, deductive reasoning skills and say, okay, how's the composer thinking about this? What's the best way to describe it? Because sometimes you can go through and pick out some of these chords, but then other chords won't work with that sort of analysis. So try and find the analysis that's gonna work for most parts of the piece. Since this is a short section of music and I know that B flat sharp 11, like I know what that chord is, it makes sense to me. So it's just a shorthand for me to notate it down. Uh, maybe we could go um, a little bit further into this and say Stravinsky is actually playing around with this idea of the split chord tone down here with the bassoon solo, the uh, contra bassoon solo. Uh, could be, could be something like that. It's so hard to hear. Let me turn it up. That sound actually, the timpani with the bassoon is great. Spooky chord. That's gonna get loud again. Okay, that section there where we have the like, that section is so film music. So much film music uh, has that sort of gesture in it. So I wanna just steal that, just lift it right out of the score. Uh, then you can be a film composer. Look at that. Just. Look at this. This is your Bible. Just just go through here, listen to every moment, do what I've done, and then whenever you want to write film music, just go in and do exactly what Stravinsky did. No creativity required. Um, oh, there's actually a consort, uh, Suldi, contrabassoon, playing there as well with the timpani. So making that's a really cool sound. Timpani, timpani, double bass, and bassoon, all quite high. I wonder what that would sound like with harp on the first note. See, then try that out. Write it in your next piece and see what happens. When you discover something like that, let's analyze this chord. Da -na 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 -na. It's a cool chord. It's a lot of harmonics. Remember harmonics are the, the sounding pitch is the pitch that is the bottom. The top note is not the sounding pitch. So we have B, E flat, B. Uh, is that altos? Whoop, B. E flat F. P, E flat F. Ooh. Serenzi's using the weird harmonics that I don't know. I know the natural harmonics. It's a C, C on the bottom with this on top. But I think it's my favorite chord. I think it's just a major, a minor major chord. I bet that's what it is. Let's go back and listen to it. Not far enough. Not far enough. Not far enough. What? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm gonna try this again. It's so hard to hear. It's so quiet. Okay. You actually hear, you hear the bass a lot in that sound. Yep, that's the chord. All right, let's listen to this gesture. Okay, so obviously bass drum and timpani and then huge cymbal crash. I think that's what it is. Oh, no timpani, just bass drum. Bass drum and then tam-tam rolls to a forte. Not cymbals, so tam-tam. Bass drum. Bass drum keeps going actually. Timpani enters at the at the moment, uh, uh, the big moment. We have a gliss in the strings. Gliss is in the strings, tutti. Horn has a gliss. And winds have a gesture to move through as well. They are playing. Um,
Okay, so they're playing like it's like a C at sharp four. I think everyone is going to have that. Yep. Everyone has that. That makes sense as a chord to glist through in the horn because the horn is going to play overtones and the sharp four is going to be in the overtones. So that's why this makes sense and why this works. Um, yeah. Sweet. Good job, Stravinsky. So give your winds uh, um, motion upwards. Horns, gliss, strings, gliss. Bass drum and tam tam, creating the huge swoosh, the orchestral swoosh underneath. Everyone arrives, and then you have some giant orchestral hits orchestrated with flutes up top, clarinets underneath, oboes underneath that, bassoons and celli, violin twos are doing accompaniment material, and then we have horns, uh, trumpets, horns, trombones, really close together right in the center of the register. And these guys are playing, they're gonna play the C7 chord a bit. They're just gonna play. Yep. That's what they're playing. Actually, uh, yeah, that's what they're playing. They're playing this. Ah, it's a very Lydian sound. It's like a Lydian chord, Lydian. It's like a Lydian chord with a, uh, it's like one add four, Lydian, that's it. So it's like, don't even need to think about a sharp four. Just think about it in Lydian. Uh, this feels like this specific thing was lifted specifically into the matrix. Listen to it again. I think that like, I think I'm right. Oh no. Okay, here it is. Not that part, but the first part. It sounds very Matrix-like. Okay, then they guess this big. Now, this is impressive from a rhythmic perspective. You got a pentuplet, then a triplet, then a landing, then the same gesture up. Uh, it's actually really neat that be just because of how he's orchestrated it and how the tam-tam creates that flourish, you know that the tam-tam is always gonna cool down, then you can like warm it up and do it again, so. Uh, it's, that's good. Uh, here we have trumpets that are moving around while everyone else stays static on a chord. And the chord they're static on is... I missed the sharp at the beginning of the bar for one of the people. Oh, it's a, that's, a, that's an A because it's a piccolo trumpet. It's just whole tone music. Nice. It's nice when things are simple like that. So you just have a whole tone line. Everyone else is going crazy doing the same thing they've been doing the whole time. Obviously trumpets are the most important thing. You've got orchestral hits behind this. The orchestral hits are in the brass, upper winds with a flourish in the piccolo and then strings playing a giant double stop all down bow. Those piccolo gestures, very Stravinsky. If this was uh, Firebird or Petrushka, there would definitely be some kind of mallet percussion in there. Tring, tring, really uh, emphasizing each one of these points. We land here on the next page. Looks like more orchestral hits, but same thing. Trumpets have uh, the main melody. Ooh, I'm, I'm interested to hear this uh, little horn gesture that pops in for a moment, this guy. That's gonna be cool. Uh, we got the same, in the, in the strings, we're getting this like Lydian chord a lot, or it's like, got an A with it now, but then you get like the Lydian chord and you go to a chord that has an A in it and then back to the Lydian chord, and then to a D major chord. It's kind of like uh, Lydian, and then, and then. That's like a harmonic kind of motion moving around. You can hardly hear those poor horns. <laughs> 
like you can hardly hear them. Uh, this is a masterclass rhythmically. Uh, in terms of when the melody comes in, it feels extremely irregular all the time. Um, bum, bum, bum. So sometimes the melody, so the melody is like sometimes with the bar in three, and then other times it's just uh, doing a hemiola. So it's in two, everyone else is in three. The, the shots, I mean. Like, so like the whole orchestra is going in three, basically. And then you have hemiola. You also have that hemiola set up by the accents that he's putting into the, uh, the bass drum part. Neat. Neat. Stravinsky, why are you so smart? Uh, those rips on the horns, it's like so effective. <laughs> Oh, it's good. And then, uh, and then, yeah, you get this giant sound. It's like um, when he's creating these big, these tutti sounds that are like da 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 da. Those really aggressive hits are orchestrated similar to everything else, but in this case, he's actually brought his oboes up really high. So he's all his winds up really high, and then all the brass right in this middle register. So everyone is very concentrated. It doesn't make sense to have your winds competing for space with the brass. They're not gonna support, they're not gonna help anything. Uh, I learned this when I was or um, orchestrating big chords for orchestra and they're like, well, if you have all the brass playing, like just get the winds up doing something high because basically if the winds are in the staff, they're gonna be obliterated by the brass. So just try and get them up. He's got oboes really high. Look at those oboes, look at this oboe part. It's an E, that's pretty high. I don't know, it's not the highest note, but that's pretty high. It's not gonna be super strong, but uh, I don't think he cares about that. Uh, if it was down low, it would also be irrelevant. Should the oboes play? Well, it's nice to make them play. You want as much sound as possible. It's kind of weird, huge tutti thing. And then the oboes are just sitting there. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel good as a player to do that. I think something else that I wanna note, and this is uh, something that I would do, is that these huge swells, these he just uses them as a swell. I would swell and go to something. Something like that, or like like he did before. But in this case, nope, just swell. Nope, didn't do it, didn't go anywhere. What? Where's it going? Like it 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 actually creates a lot of dramatic tension about the hemiola and how the things are off the beat. Because then it's like, oh yeah, okay, it oh, didn't lead anywhere. Oh, oh, then this thing happens. Okay, great. Like here, he, he's kind of leading to this horn gesture, but like you can hardly hear the horns. Like I'm just, whatever. Oh, so much energy. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, <laughs> let's look at 74 rhythmically. One, two. So he lands on first two beats, kind of establishes a pulse, then lands on the downbeat, great. Then displaces things. This is a displacement. That's displaced. And you got a he hemioli. Oh, no, that's... This is technically this. And then we have on two. So quite neat. That rhythm there. I like that a lot. Hey, John Williams, I see you. I see what you stole for Star Wars. It's like the action music whenever that theme is used like for action. Okay, how does he do it? How does Stravinsky do it, I mean? Uh, it's like a strings are doing like a... Whew. <laughs> this is so John Williams. So the uh, the trumpet and the horn, everything is interacting polyrhythmically here, actually. That's what's creating a ton of the energy. So... And then we have on top of that. It 
that was a thing before. Nice. So using something that was thematic before now as an inner line, that's really neat. Uh, it's interesting how this complements. So this is a B flat major tetrachord with uh, the tritone underneath it. F sharp tritone. It's an interesting choice. It's almost like we have a diminished seventh chord, but it's just a little bit different. It's almost, it's almost, yeah. It's almost a French French sixth chord, but not quite. That's a very interesting, very interesting choice. Uh, this has a ton of ton of energy. Like, it's also key to note that the bass clarinet is playing this little passage, which I believe is just a whole tone scale, and that's creating a ton of drive. So this thing is creating drive because we've got something that moves up over and over and over again, that kind of motion, it's gonna create this sense that like we need to go somewhere. Then we have this rhythmic energy and impetus underneath. Yeah, this has got a ton of energy. So you hear the horns when they all come in, they have these like, He's got almost, yeah, he's got constant triplet motion at this point in the horns. And then the timpani is going underneath with uh, 16th notes. Strings are going in 16th notes. So they've sped up overall. They started in uh, the polyrhythmic four against three, but now they're not. Um, as you emphasize the brass, obviously the strings can just all go together and do something. Uh, lots of octaves in his celli and then scale-like material in the other instruments. Probably sticking to scale-like material because it's more playable by the players if they have to play something that's very hard or doesn't have a nice pattern to it that they've practiced before in exercises or other pieces. It's a little bit hard to play. So you give them something that's scalar and then blur it with something else going on in the orchestra, you can create a very complex effect but having player by having players just play very simple musical elements. In this case, it looks like they're all just playing what is basically a C minor scale at this point. And there's the F sharp in there, obviously, just screwing everything up. Tritones all over the place. Thanks, Stravinsky. Those strings, those strings have a great sound. That's good. So that would be really cheesy if it was not covered, but it has this, it's got a lot of energy in it, but it's a small fragment. Like when I hear that material, that I think it's always like, I always think wider than it actually is. It's just a within a, within basically a tritone. Huh, more tritones, thanks Stravinsky. Okay, looks like we got some big horn stuff coming up. This is, uh, that's very high. That's very high. Danger zone. If you get into those accidentals and it's transposed, it's uh, it's really high. We're gonna have another, no, we don't have one of the, so how does he emphasize this one? This is key to note, three against two in the uh, in the timpani and the, in the bass drum. We just have these runs. These runs are, this is something worth looking at. Do you see how he's written harmonic tones there, not just a doubling? It's not like all the same pitches. It's probably gonna have a little bit of a bigger sound just because of that, instead of just all being unisons. And then we're gonna arrive at these giant chords, chords orchestrated, uh, trumpets on top, trombones underneath, horns creating this constant triplet motion usually repeating tones, because brass is very good at repeating tones, and then jumping to another tone and moving back and forth. So not playing scales. <laughs> they play some scales, but not, not as much as the strings. Look at the strings. Strings are scales all over the place. Scales within about, uh, usually a tritone, moving up and down, scales. Then you have uh, everyone else accompanying, and you have upper winds, so clarinets, oboes, and flutes, with the trumpets playing these chords. Uh, Horns creating the background texture and strings also creating the background texture. Strings doing the 16th note motion, horns doing the triplet motion.
that rip, you hardly hear it because it's just the upper winds. It's like really background. I wonder if I was reorchestrating this, which would be sacrilegious at this point in history, but if I was reorchestrating this, I wonder if there's a way to drop horns out for like two bars, like have three of your horns drop out while the other ones keep going and they just fill the texture and get really tired all at once. And then you still have that horn rip in there just to give like a little bit more support to that gesture. Yeah, obviously if you're a film composer, just like dump in another MIDI instrument and make it happen. But for us who, us lowly composers who actually write for musicians, it's like, well, in that case, I got to find a way to make it work. Got to find a way to get everyone playing, which can be hard because they're playing very loud. And uh, yeah, yeah, you want them, you want like the same density of texture all the time. Like Stravinsky usually has three people playing at any given moment in his horn section, sometimes four. So it is kind of like moving back and forth a little bit. Uh, I probably would have been a little bit more equal with it where it's like always the same number of people playing. The only time that there's more is a dovetail when someone's discontinuing and someone else is continuing on. Uh, but he doesn't do that. He has three, mostly three actually. There are rare moments when there are four. So three here, 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 four right here for two eighth notes, three, 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 four, three. There's only two moments of four. So he's done that pretty well. Uh, I just wonder maybe like this guy could have got left out or something like that. And then that he could have done a rip and the other guy could have done a rip right here. Fill that out, get more uh, emphasis on that gesture. <laughs> so those, those hits at the end are really effective. Uh, it's kind of wild how effective those are, actually. Let's look at the orchestration. Um, also good to look at the chord. Oh my gosh, I keep drawing this chord. I don't want to draw this chord. I want to see the last chord. There we go. Okay, so up way up there at top, we have a G and an F. And then in the flute, unreadable is a C underneath that. It's this way up here. It's, it's the top of the keyboard. C and then we have a G underneath that in the alto flute. It's going to be way lower down. Oboes are up really high playing the same material, same chord. So it's still this, just this Lydian chord. I think at this point though, he, what, what about the trumpets? I have the feeling that there's, yeah, there's no third up high. So he's put the third underneath now. Third's down here. Like that. I was playing a third. And he ends like that. And that's it. That is the first section of the Rite of Spring. I got through the entire thing. It took me roughly seven hours. I recommend to everyone who wants to be a composer that you should all do this yourself. You should do this in more detail than I've done it. I'm doing it fairly fast because unfortunately my life is very busy and I don't have much time. Uh, but I would recommend to everyone who wants to learn about composition, you need to go through pieces and take them apart in this detail. So one of the things actually to this point in my compositional life, I regret, I regret not pulling things apart in this much detail. So hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you've enjoyed the first part. I'm going to come back and do the second part, uh, and then I'll probably restructure these series and do them a little bit differently from here on in. So thanks for watching. See you in the next one.